saved is important. And then to be able to transfer that to the future generations is essential. If we do not show the importance of these majalis to our children, if we do not show the importance of these gatherings to our children, the future of this azar will not cease to exist, but rather this azar will be taken away from us. Because we never taught our children, we never showed it in our actions, that when the musiba is, be, is being recited, the mathia is being recited, and I'm having a full-blown conversation, shows how much I actually care for the message of the imam. If my aqidah is that the imam of my time is there and is present, my aqidah is that Sayyidah Zahra is present, then how is it that when the musibah is being recited, that I could be in that state of having a full-blown conversation and not being aware of the surroundings within which I sit? These are gatherings where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising within Hadith Qudsi, uh, in Hadith al Kisa, he's saying to the Holy Prophet, or the Holy Prophet is saying to Amir al Mu'mineen, he's saying, Ya Ali, by Allah, the one that has made me a prophet, that whenever our Shias gather and they mention our remembrance, Hafat bihimul malaika, the angels encircled those, uh, encircled those individuals. And they do istighfar for them until they leave that place. These majalis, these gatherings have a huge station in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How we teach, how we translate that to our future generations is essential. The adab of the majlis, what is it that they do when they come to the majlis? How is it that we sit in the majlis? What is it? The, the maqam of crying for Aba Abdullah. You know, the, when it comes to the narrations, it says, Man baka alil Hussein. One narration says, The one that does buka upon Aba Abdullah, which I spoke about in the first lecture. But another narration says, Man baka aw tabka. The one that cries, the one that make aw abka, the one that makes a person cry. Oh, the one that does tabaki says you can't cry. Your sins are so much that Allah has removed the ability for tears to fall from your eyes. Says still, do not lose hope. Says do tabaki. What is tabaki? Says if you can't shed a tear, at the very least, just lower your head. Show some semblance of honoring the message of Abba Abdullah. Just lower your head. Says if you do that, understanding the maqam and the station, of Imam al Hussein wajibat lahul jannah, Allah will make jannah wajib upon you. Not only the one that cries, or the one that makes others cry, even the one that has been deprived of the honor of crying, even if he lowers his head, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses that individual with Jannah. Because these tears are not something that we should take for granted. See, tears are those things that are bestowed upon an individual. The sign of the acceptance of your dua is what? The narration say, when tears fall from your eyes. When you raise your hands in front of Allah and you ask Him, and tears fall from your eyes, know that he has answered. When you do istighfar and you ask for forgiveness of your sins and tears fall from your eyes, know that your istighfar, your repentance has been accepted. Then it says that when you go on ziyarah, 
and you say assalamu alayka ya aba abdullah you stand in front of the body of imam al hussein or you stand in front of the body of abu fadl al abbas or you stand in front of the bodies at samarra or in kadhaniya or in mashhad or in jannatul baqi or in medina and you say salam upon that individual the sign of the reply from the imam is that tears will fall from your eyes. But at times, tears don't fall. And there are reasons for it. The hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Holy Prophet, he says, min Says the dryness of your eyes is because of the rust upon your heart. And your rusty heart is as a result of your excessive sins. And your excessive sins are because you've forgotten your death. And you've forgotten your death because you've got long, far-fetched hopes for yourself. You've set out your whole life plan. You've said, I'm going to reach this level. Oh, I'm going to study this, I'm going to get there in my career, I'm going to have children, I'm going to buy this car, I'm going to buy this house, I'm going to have all of this, but nowhere in my grand plan have I factored in the chance or the possibility that my soul may be separated from my body, i.e. I may die, it says you have forgotten your death because of your long far-fetched hopes and your long far-fetched hopes are as a result of your love of this world and the love of the world is the root of all sin any sin that a person commits the root of it is in their attachment to this realm, in their attachment to this dunya. And I'm not saying that hubb dunya is bad or that when I mean attachment to this world is you can't have any, anything nice and that you must revoke everything and go and live in a cave somewhere. It's not what I'm saying. I mean, Al Mu'mini explains it the best. He says, Zuhad, asceticism. Spirituality, getting closer to God, living that simplistic life to ascend towards Allah. He says, Zuhad is not that you do not own anything. Zuhad is not that you do not own anything. Rather, Zuhad, asceticism is that nothing owns you. That I have this iPad or I have this iPhone or that I have this car. There's nothing wrong with me having those nice things. But tomorrow when this breaks, how many days do I mourn for it? Or my brand new phone that I got and the first day I got it, I dropped it and scratched it. How I wish I had broke the cover. And I mourn every time I pick that photo. <laughs> Scratched my phone. Or oh, my new car. I buy it a week later, it gets scuffed. And every time I look at it, I don't like you anymore. Because it's embellished. There's a scratch on it. Amirul Mu'mineen is saying, Zohad is not that you do not own anything. Rather, it is that nothing owns you. It doesn't affect your personality. You're detached from it. You've got good things. But when it's taken away from you, then you say that it's from Allah. And Allah took it back. I don't mourn over it for three weeks, four weeks. Every time I look at my replacement phone, I say, you know, there was a time I had an iPhone. But I dropped it in a puddle. And I didn't have the insurance. And then that's why I'm now stuck with this phone. Says it's not that you do not own anything, rather it is that nothing owns you. You're not attached to it. It doesn't affect your personality. 
one of those things that also, you know, attachment to the, the world has different facets. One of those attachments is the one to food. The attachment that people have to food. You see how grumpy people become when they're hungry. And you just have to see everyone's attitude change when it's Shah Ramadan. The first two or three days I walk into work and I'm like, Lord, don't talk to me. Okay, because I'm fasting. And I want everyone to know that I'm hungry. And I'm fasting. And I have this like sort of this sad face on my, you know, on me that, you know, I'm fasting. And, you know. This desire or this being run by one's stomach is also what leads a person towards their spiritual destruction. That I'm so bound, my personality is so linked to my stomach that when I do not get the food that I want, I become really upset. How weak is that human being? How lowly is that human being whose personality is dictated by the things that he eats? That is aspiration in life. Is what is it that I'm going to next eat and take a picture so I can put it on Instagram and everyone will know that I'm a foodie. Mm -hmm. Hashtag food grab. Okay. Yeah. Because we want everyone to know that look how I'm a great foodie. I've gone out and eating all of this great stuff. My personality is dictated by it. Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al-Balagha, when he speaks, he says Ali once had a brother. Now there's a discussion as to who Amir al-Mu'mineen is referring to. Is it Abu Dhar? Is it Meqdad? Is it Salman? Some say actually it may be in reference to Uthman ibn Maz'un. Uthman ibn Maz'un is the companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen that was killed in one of the battles. And this is who Amir al muminin names his own son Uthman after. Where others say, oh no, he named him after someone else. No. He says, I named this son of mine Uthman after my friend Uthman ibn Maz'un. Says, maybe he's referring to him. Says that Ali used to have a brother. And he was honored in my eyes. Imagine, Amir al muminin is saying, an individual is honored in his eyes. Why was he honored in your eyes, Ya Ali? dunya fi Because the dunya had a small place in his eyes. He didn't give importance to the dunya. Second characteristic, The second thing that Amir al-Mu'mineen says is that he had removed himself from the sovereignty of his stomach. He wasn't ruled by his stomach. His personality wasn't dictated by his stomach. I don't know if you've seen um, these, uh, you guys have these adverts over here, but Snickers did a, an ad uh, recently. I, I'm not sure if I've seen it here, but in England, it's running. It says, um, you know, someone's personality changes and give, they give them a Snickers. And the person eats it, he turns back into himself. He says, you're not you when you're hungry. Yeah? <laughs> so do you guys have that kind of over here as well? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So it's not totally alien to you. Um, so this whole idea, the whole society has been made in this obsession, this worshipping one's stomach, that when we come towards fasting or we come towards somewhere where we're restricting ourselves of food, now it becomes for us like a huge burden. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the Holy Prophet and saying about the people of the dunya, he says, the people of the, he says to the Holy Prophet, Ya Ahmad, Abghad al-dunya wa ahlaha, wa habba al-akhirati wa ahlaha. O Ahmad, hate the dunya and its people, and love the akhirah and its, and its people. And the Holy Prophet asks, Ya Allah, who are the people of the dunya? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lists 27 characteristics. Says the people of the dunya are those that eat too much, sleep too much, laugh too much. They're very rarely satisfied. Just look at these first four. They're often angry. These four or five, there's 27 others. 
But amongst this, twice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a reference to food. One, they eat too much. The second, they get overjoyed at the sight of food. See, even food sometimes dictates our religiosity, our attendance to the messenger. We're like, oh, better go today to the Hamid Nihari. Or it even, it, it, it basically, it, it gives us the drive to even turn up. Oh, I have to go because Fulan is sponsoring the Niyaz today. Yeah? And they've asked me to come because they've sponsored it. Forget Allah! This human being has invited Fulan coming. Oh no, I have to go because you know, they're Niyaz and they're asking for the food. So I have to go. A human being's personality dictated by their stomach, how ludicrous. But yet when we look at our own lives day to day, it is exactly what we do. It's everything we do. You ask people, you know, what is it that you work for? It's, ah, you know, I just, just work to put food on my table. Yeah, we, we say this, don't we? <laughs> Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahd al-Balaba. He says, says, the worth of a man and woman, we'll be equal here. The worth of a man, well, I have to be careful in America, honestly. In England, you know, people have got you know, strong chins. In America, you guys have really glass chin. You know, say one thing wrong, it's like, ah, oh, down with them. Uh, anyhow, uh, so it's, uh, it says, قَدْرُ رَجُلٍ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ حِمَّتِهِ the worth of a human being is equivalent to their ambition. If you want to know the worth of a human being, ask them what their ambition is in life. What is it that they hope to achieve? Where is it that they hope to be? If they have no ambition, they have no worth. And then he says in a later narration, if a human being's ambition in life is solely to place food on his table. His worth is equivalent to that which comes out of his backside, having consumed it. Can you imagine? I just want to, I just want to put food on my table, just to feed my kids. He says, no. And if that is your only ambition in life, then your worth is equivalent to that which comes out of your backside. He says, have higher ambition. Aim towards perfection. In fact, this dua that we are looking at, dua makarimul akhlaq, the first thing that we say in it after reciting salawat, we say, Balligh imani akmal al iman. My Lord, give me iman, but the perfection of iman. Wa yaqini. And my certainty to the best of yaqeen. And make my intention the best of intentions. He says, why are you aiming for the middle of the road? See, when we do dua, often we raise our hands and we're like, Ya Allah, I've got this problem. Let's do, let's do financial got this financial problem. If you can help me, that's great. But at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, you've got a week. If not, then I know someone who hooked me up last time. You know, <laughs> if you can't help me, Allah, then, you know, I, at the back of my mind, I've got the bank manager or oh, this person I'm going to go and ask. We never have this dua of total certainty that Allah will answer. And so as a result, our du'as are not accepted. Or then when we aim, when we do du'a, we think like we're asking someone just like us. So I'm, I'm just, I'm like, if you could maybe, you know, sort it out for me to have this. Whereas here the Imam is saying, بَلِّغْ إِمَانِ أَكْمَلَ iman. I don't want anything else. I want iman, but I don't want that middle of the road iman. Now I want perfection. Akmal al Iman. Give me the perfection. The Imam is teaching us 
that when you do dua, do not think God is like you. God is the, the one that possesses all the ability to do anything. He wishes, He wills. It's qadr mutlaq When you ask Him, ask Him for whatever you want and ask Him for the perfection. If you want wealth, if you're struggling for rizq, say, my Lord, not to increase my rizq, my Lord, give me so much risk after which I don't need to ask again. Why can't I do that? When I do my dua in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it lacks something because I don't really believe. If I truly believed, then my relationship with Him would be very different. And you see that in Karbala, individuals. You see, say the shahada that he's given everything, and when the narration say that when he falls to the ground, and the individual that says, "I was striking Hussein as he was lying on the ground," I had never seen an individual so beaten, so bloodied, that had lost so much in one day, but yet his face so bright. He himself says, Ilahi, taraktu al-khalqi mu'man fi hawaka, wa itamtu al-ayana likay araka, wa inkata'tani bil-hubbi iraban irada, yamal al-fu'adu ila siwaka. My Lord, I've left the whole of creation for your sake. I've orphaned my children so that I may see you. And even if the swords were to come and cut me to pieces, my heart would turn to none but you. Karbala is the height of that love for Allah. Karbala is the greatest love story ever told. Karbala is the peak of Tawheed. Shaykh Mohsin Nakri has a beautiful poem about it. Tawheed ki chahat to bin kalbu bala chan Wallah ye kadhi khul ke kiri hai na khile di Tawheed na masjid mein na masjid ki safo mein Tawheed tujhe shabbir ke sajdo mein But if you want Tawheed then come towards Karbala because you will find it in that sajda of Abi Abdullah the beauty that Sayyidah Zainab is referring to. That beauty where she's saying in front of Ibn Ziyad, I said to you on the first night, give you a few examples. Sister Mama, Aytu illa Jamila. Zainab saw nothing but beauty. The beauty she sees is that night of Ashura. People know that tomorrow they will die. Abi Abdullah has told each and every one of them. But yet they spend the night in prayer. Imam comes to his sister. Ukhayya Zainab, إِذَا قُمْتِ إِلَى نَافِلَةِ اللَّيْلِ أُذْكُرِينِ My sister Zainab, when you stand for your Salatul Layl, remember me. Remember your brother. It's the beauty of Karbala. That ubudiya, that submission towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Sayyidah Zainab from Karbala, Imam al-Sajjad narrates, from Karbala to Sham, along the way, he says, my aunt Zainab, forget her wajibat, she did not miss her Salatul Layl, she recited that Salatul Layl even upon the back of the camel. That's love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this journey towards Allah is easy if one puts their mind to it. See, there are certain, I don't want to say not loopholes, but there are certain ways where a person can work smart as opposed to hard in order to achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you a couple of examples. The first is with your Salat al layl 11 raka'ah to be recited after midnight, after true midnight. 
11 raka'ah, but it's mustahab. The first eight raka'ah are with the niyyah of Salatul Layl in units of two. The second two raka'ah are known as Salatul Shafa, in within which there is no qurut. And the last one raka'ah is Salatul Vitr, within which there is Surat Al Hamd, three times Surat Tawheed, one time Surat Falak, one time Surat Al Nas. Then you go into the Qunut where you list 40 Mu'mineen's names. Allahumma fili Fulan, Allahumma fili Fulan. After that, you do 70 times Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa Atubu ilayh. After that, you do seven times Hadha Maqam al Aid bika min al Nar. After that, you do 300 times Al Aaf, Al Aaf. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. You go, you finish that khunut, ruqus, the two sujood, the salam, over. 11 rakah. But sometimes the soul isn't ready. I haven't trained my soul to be able to bear that amount of ibadat in one go. Because the soul is much like muscles. That unless you've trained it to do so, it finds all sorts of excuses for a person not to do it. I hear a lecture and go, you know what, tonight I am gonna pray Salat al And I get home and I'm like, oh, you know what, too tired. Tomorrow, inshallah. And then tomorrow never comes. <clears throat> and every time I do it. So if those 11 rakah are too difficult, I say, all right, no problem. Get rid of the eight raka'ah of Salat al-Layl. Just recite the two raka'ah of Salat al-Shifa and the one raka'ah of Salat al It says, if that is too difficult for you, then get rid of the eight raka'ah of Salat al-Layl, the two raka'ah of Salat al-Shifa and recite the one raka'ah of Salat al -Vitr. Say, if that is too difficult because you can't remember all the dhikr, no problem, it's mustahab. Get rid of the eight rakah of Salat al-Layl, the two rakah of Salat al-Shifa, the one rakah of Salat al vitr If I can't recite 70 times, recite it 10 times, 300 times, do it 100 times. I can't remember how the maqam al ayyadi became in al-Nar and don't recite it. Just lower all of it. If you say, no, even that is too difficult, says, okay, no problem. Do the niyat of reciting the one rakah of Salat al vitr raise your hand, say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, go down, finish the one raka of Salat al vitr and that is equivalent to your Salat al layl wow. If that is. If that is too difficult for you, because it involves you getting out of bed after midnight. If that is too difficult for you, says no problem, recite it after your Salat al Isha. Says if that is too difficult for you, you see where we started off from and where I'm going. Says if that's too difficult for you, that you can't recite it after Salat al Isha, that one rakah is too much, and now you're already in bed, you've done wudu, you're still in wudu, you're already in bed, and now you can't be bothered to get out of bed, says no problem, lay there and recite it from your bed. So mustahab salah. You can lay in your bed and recite. You can't bother to move your body, no problem, just with your finger. You're driving the car. Do a two rakat mustahab salah as you're driving, no problem. Just use your finger, use your eyes. I mean, I wouldn't use your eyes if I'm, you know, especially if you're closing your eyes is to symbolize your sajda, especially if you're driving. I never recommend that. Don't close your eyes. Uh, but you know, if you're walking the street, going anywhere, you can recite the mustahab salah. Sitting here, you can recite the mustahab salah. No one will ever know. You can takhmiru to the haram, you start reciting. This is how easy it is. Fasting. You want the thawab of the fast of a whole month. So no problem. Do a mustahab, uh, salah, uh, mustahab fast. 13th, 14th and 15th of every lunar month. The ayam of bil, The days of light. So as you fast in these three nights, in these three days, it is as if you have fasted the whole month. Says, but no, it's a mustahabs fast. <laughs> I'll give you another 
<laughs> not loophole, but it's bad to call it loophole. Yeah. You know, when you're doing a mustahab fast, and someone, this doesn't apply to wajib, I just want to put this out there. And what I said about Salat al doesn't apply to wajib salah. Those 17 rakah, oh, you have to pray normally as you always pray. Mustahab fast. I wake up in the morning and I say, because according to even Sayyid Sistani, you can make the niyyah of a mustahab fast before the adhan of dhuhr. So you didn't make the niyyah the night before, you wake up in the morning and think, ah, you know what? I skipped breakfast anyway. And I'm not going to eat till I get home from work. And I'm too late. So I know I'm not going to drink anything or eat anything. It says, okay, make the niyyah of mustahab fast. There and then. So you come home, you do your iftar, you do mustahab fast, you have the whole thawab of a mustahab fast. It says, if you've got a mustahab fast and someone comes up to you, a mu'min, comes up to you and says, oh, do you want a crisp? Um, you guys call them chips. Yeah. So if you do you want a chip? And I said, oh no, I'm I'm fasting. Yeah? He says, no, don't say that. Take the chip, eat it. Your fast will be broken, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the thawab of a full day's fast. And also the person that did your iftar, the thawab of a full day's fast. So as soon as you come out, I'm doing a Muslim fast, and someone's like, oh, let me, it's 10 minutes, you've only been doing it 10 minutes, but someone offers you stew. Get the thawab of the full day. By the way, this doesn't work by, oh, by the way, tomorrow I'm going to do a mustahab fast. If anyone wants to, <laughs> just putting it out there, handing out sawab, if anyone wants to come and, you know, break my fast. Um, but if someone offers it to you, or if someone knows you're doing a mustahab fast, and they actively come up to you and say, look, I want you to break the fast, I want you to do your iftar, then you have the thawab of it. So you see, the religion has been made easy for us. To be able to progress towards Allah. And side by side with that is our topic of discussion around Dua Makarim al -akhlaq. We've been listing those moral characteristics that a person needs to have to achieve the proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus far, we began by saying that the Imam says, and bisni, when bisni zinat al muttaqin my Lord clothed me in the clothing of the muttaqin fi bast al adl, by establishing, by making me a person that establishes justice, wa kadm al ghayb, a person that makes, uh, that swallows their anger, wa itfa al naira, a person who extinguishes the flames of hatred within themselves. A person that brings together those that have been disunited. The one that does Amr bil Ma'ruf corrects any sort of deviation and discord and problems within their society. And then the one that spreads good behavior. And we've up until yesterday we went to this point. Today I want to look at a couple more. Where the Imam says, And make me the one that covers the faults of others. It is so easy nowadays to expose the faults of people. Riba for us has become something just common. You know, riba, backbiting about people, just rolls off my tongue, just like nothing has happened. Riba is equivalent to eating the flesh. Allah says in the Surah Hujurat, that backbiting about someone, telling tales about someone, is equivalent to you consuming the flesh of your dead brother. Riba is that one sin that an individual can never be forgiven for by Allah. Allah will never forgive you for the riba that you have done over a person until the person who you did the backbiting about turns around and forgives you. And many people will be held on Yawm Al-Qiyamah for the amount of riba that they did. 
One single action of riba. Say, when you do riba about someone, all the good that you did is transferred to that person. And all the evil they did is transferred to you. On Yom al they say there will be a mu'min, he will come forward for ready and be given his book of deeds and he will open it and say, Ya Allah, there's a problem here. This is why. So we don't make any problem. We don't make any um, mistakes. Says, Ya Allah, I did hajj in my life. It's not here. I went to the ziyarah of Aba Abdullah. It's not here. I used to recite Ziyarat Ashura every day. It's not here. It says I never recited Salat al in my life, but I recited it every day since I was 14. Ya Allah, what's going on? And then here, there's some sins. I, I never committed zina in my life. I never did this in my life. It says, no, but the person you did the riba of did. Because you did back, you backbited about that individual. We took all of your good deeds. We gave them to him. We took all of his sins and we gave them to you. He says, now your place is hell. Through riba. And sometimes you're like, no, no, no. What I'm saying is true. Yeah, the fact that you're saying that what you're saying is true, that's what means it's a riba. If it was not true, that would be torment. That would be slander. That has its own punishment. The fact that what you know to be true and to be an aib of a person, to be a fault or a sin of a person, you then go and tell someone that does not know about it, that is riba. And the person who listens to the riba as well. You know, some of us, we, we like to hear it. You know, it just gives us, warms us up. We like it. You know, it's like, what else? What else? You know, some people like telling. Some people just love listening and collecting all of that information. Says that you did, you exposed this person in the dunya. Allah will expose you in your mulakha. But there are certain types. There are certain individuals whose riba is allowed. Now this is the part I was up for. <laughs> so the the narration say there are certain individuals whose riba is allowed. One is a person who is the leader of a of a nation, leader of a community, uh, or a scholar that leads a community, in order to save a person or a community from going into degradation further. So you're able to expose the ills of that individual. Or someone that is in a position of leadership that is dictating to others. In that instant, it is allowed. Or in the cases of marriage, if you think that a person has such a bad characteristic that if this individual knew or if they, they're not gonna, they've not done toba, they continue on doing this. You know, it's not like one time you saw them accidentally go and do something and now every time, you know, someone says, well, what about this person? Oh, well, there was this time. You have never seen them after that. But you know that someone has an inherent problem. So to tell people about that, it's fine. Certain groups can do riba amongst themselves. For example, if in this gathering you all witness, I pick up this glass and, uh, you know, it's filled with beer and I start saying, oh, this is beer and I'm drinking it. That's an aid that you've all seen. You can discuss it amongst yourselves, and it's not riba because you were all party to it, you all viewed it. But the moment you go outside and tell anyone outside, that's when it becomes riba. So you have to be very careful. Wasatr al aiba says the people, the muttaqeen, are those that hide the faults of others. Why? What is the driving factor for us? To hide the faults of other human beings. It is that if you hide their faults, Allah will hide your faults from the people as well. If you cover up the fault of an individual, you see someone do something haram, but you stay quiet about it, 
Allah too will continue to hide your sins. He covers the sins of people. So when you make yourself an individual who covers the faults of other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also show rahm upon you. When you become a forgiving person, says, Irham says, when you forgive, Allah will forgive you. But if you hold grudges against another believer and choose not to forgive someone, it says Allah won't forgive you either. So it says you forgive and Allah will forgive. You cover the sins and the ayb of a person, Allah will cover your ayb. And then it says, And the person who has mildness of their temper. There are certain individuals who get so angry that they can't control it. You know, as soon as you say something to them, they want to throw something, they want to break something, they want to hit someone. Amir al-Mu'mineen says anger is insanity. Because when the person calms down, they feel bad for what they have done. But if they do not feel bad for what they have done, know that the insanity has become ingrained within them. Those individuals that don't have that mildness of temperament, that are instantly becoming angry at people. This is a disease of the soul. It's not something to be proud of. It is something that will drive us towards hell. It is something that will take us away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are those two simple things that the Imam has said. From tomorrow I can start saying, you know what, I'm going to change my temperament. I'm going to try at least and be more forgiving, be more calm with people. And I'm gonna try at least and try and cover the sins of other individuals. Try and cover their faults in the hope and the desire that maybe one day, Yawmul Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not expose my faults to anyone else. And these teachings can only come from that. The purity of Ahlul Bayt. And Akhlaq is that thing that allows a person to see fiqh, halal and haram. Those are the things that will allow you to enter into heaven. But Akhlaq, these things of Satr al aiba or being mild-tempered, or being having husn al-khul, having good manners, speaking to people in a good way, says those things will allow you to ascend in the realms of heaven. Fiqh will allow you to enter into heaven. Akhlaq is what will allow you to ascend towards Allah. And if you want to see the embodiment or the effect of good akhlaq, then look no further than the plains of Karbala. The embodiment of akhlaq is none other than Ali al-Akbar. You see the dua that Abu Abdullah makes. It says, O oh Allah, bear witness, this son of mine resembled the Prophet khalqan wa khuluqan because of the akhlaq of the Prophet. Ali Akbar is dear to us all. On the day of Ashura, they say when Ali al-Akbar came to visit Abu Abdullah after all the Ashab had died. He came to his father, he stood in front of Abu Abdullah, says, Father, give me permission to go out and fight. Where you hear that every other companion to Abu Abdullah said to them, no, not now, later. Says, but when his son Ali Akbar came, his 27-year-old son standing in front of him, they say Abu Abdullah straight away gave him permission. But at the same time as giving him permission, فَنَظَرَ آيْسٍ مِنْ Hussein looked with pain in his eyes, with sorrow in his eyes towards his son. 
He says to him, Ilayya, Ilay, my son, come to me, come to me. Wadi'uka, wa tuwadi'uni, ashummuka, wa tushummuni. My son, come to me, let me bid you farewell. You bid me farewell. My son, let me hold you, you hold me as well. He says, Abu Abdullah says to him, Ali, let me prepare you. He prepares his son, he holds on to him. They both hold on to each other and they weep. Then Abu Abdullah sends Ali out to the battlefield. As Ali Akbar mounts upon his horse, he begins riding out into the battlefield and he hears someone running and stumbling behind him. A meek voice calling out, Ya Bulayya, Mahalan, Mahala. Oh my son, slowly, slowly. Ali Akbar turns around to see his father. He says, Ali, slowly, keep on turning around, looking at me. Let Hussein see you one last time. Ali continues to ride out, his elderly father going out behind him. They say Abu Abdullah was holding his beard in his hands. He was looking towards the heavens. He cries out, O oh Allah, bear witness that this nation they fight against that, that son of mine that resembled the Prophet. He looked like the Prophet. He acted like the Prophet. His every action was like the Prophet. Oh Allah, every time I wanted to look and remember my grandfather, I would look towards this son of mine. And then he turns towards Omar ibn Sa'ad. He says, Ya Omar ibn Sa'ad, Oh Omar ibn Sa'ad, may Allah cut off your lineage as you cut off my lineage. Abu Abdullah stands at the tent and he Akbar fights in the battlefield. They say Layla inside the tent looked at the face of Abu Abdullah. She would watch the battle of her son Ali through the face of her husband. They say whenever Abu Abdullah Abdullah would become happy, his face would be happy. She knew her son Ali was fine, but every time the face of Abu Abdullah became worried, Layla would call out, Oh Abu Abdullah, is my son Ali okay? They say at one time Abu Abdullah's face became worried. Layla turns to him and says, Ya Abu Abdullah, is my son Ali okay? She turns to, he turns to her, he says, Layla, he is fine, but he fights against a fierce opponent by the name of Bakr ibn al-Ghanim. Layla, Allah never rejects the dua of a mother. Layla, go inside and do dua for your son Ali. They say Layla goes back inside the tent. Layla raises her hands towards the heavens. Ilahi. Ilahi bi atashi abi abdillah. Ilahi bi gurbati abi abdillah. Ya rad Yusuf ila Yaqub. Ya rad Musa ila ummih. Urdud ilayya waladi Ali. O the one, O Allah, for the sake of the thirst of Abba Abdillah. O Allah, for the sake of the loneliness of Abba Abdillah. O you are the one that returned Yusuf back to Yaqub. My Lord, you are the one that returned Musa back to his mother. Oh Allah, return my son Ali back to me. Layla does the dua. Ali Akbar kills Bakr ibn al -Ghanim. He returns back towards Abu Abdullah. A father staring at his son. Only a parent knows the difficulty in the heart of Abi Abdullah when his son approaches him. No matter how old the son becomes, how elderly a father becomes, whenever the child asks the parents for anything, the parents will try and do as much as they can to aid their child. And if that thing is so simple, like a glass of water, and the parent is so majboor, the parent is so unable to help. How difficult would it be for that parent to say, no, I don't have anything to help.
Ali Akbar rides towards Abba Abdullah. He addresses his father, Ya Abata al Atasha kad qatalani, wa fiql al Hadid kad ajadani, hal li sharbat al ma. My father, the thirst is killing me. The weight of this armor is draining the strength from my body. Father, is there not a drop of water that Ali could have? Abba Abdullah says to him, Ali, there's no water, but Ali, place your tongue on my tongue. Make how majboor is Hussain that he must come to this point where he's telling his son to place his tongue on his tongue. He says, Ali, place your tongue on my tongue. Maybe there's some moisture on my tongue, Ali, that you could benefit from. They say, as Ali placed his tongue on the tongue of Abba Abdullah, he pulls it out. He says, Father, your tongue is drier than mine. Abba Abdullah says to him, Ya Ali, Ismail Qadeel. Oh Ali, do sabr for a short while, Ali. Soon you will be drinking from the pool of kofar from the hands of your grandfather, Rasulullah. Ali, go and see your mother before you go out. They say Ali Akbar enters the tents of Layla. Layla lying unconscious upon the ground. Ali takes the head of his mother. They say some of the blood from the head of Ali fell upon the head of Layla. Layla opens her eyes. Ahlan bika ya nura aini. Oh, welcome, oh, the light of the eyes of Layla. He turns to his mother. He says, Ya umma, ma hadil jada, umma hadil buka. Says, mother, what is this wailing? What is this crying? Mother, don't you see at all these other women that have given their sons for Abba Abdullah? Mother, don't you want to stand on your mulqayama in front of Fatima to Zahra and say, Ya Zahra, I gave my son Ali for your son Hussein? She says to him, Ali, go, I've given you permission to go out and fight. Ali Akbar mounts upon his horse again. He rides out towards the battlefield. He begins fighting. As he begins fighting, Amr ibn Sa'ad says, you can't attack him one on one. All of you surround him from four, all four sides. They say they surrounded Ali from all four sides. They began attacking Ali al-Akbar. Some of the narration say that a spear came into the back of Ali. He was struck with a spear that threw him forward. Another narration says that a sword struck the head of Ali al-Akbar. Now it breaks the helmet of Ali. Ali he falls forward upon his horse. The blood from the head of Ali Akbar goes inside the eyes of the horse. The horse not knowing where to go. It turns and runs inside to, towards the enemies. Now whoever had a sword in their hand, they struck the body of Ali. Whoever had an arrow, they fired it at the body of Ali. Whoever had a spear, they threw it at the body of Ali. The Makhtel says, فَقَدْتَهُ they mutilated the body of Ali Akbar. Ali falls from his horse. He cries out, Ya Abata, alayka minni salam. Sakina narrates when Ali's call came out. I was looking towards the face of my father, Abba Abdullah. He said, she says, I saw the color begin to drain from the face of my father. It was as if, it was as if his soul was leaving his body. Then my father ran in the opposite direction from the battle. Field. I said to him, Father, my brother Ali called from this side. Why do you run out to that side? He says, Sakina, do not blame me. Since Ali called out, my eyes have become dark. I can't see anything. <laughs> Some say Abba Abdullah mounted his horse and rode out. Others say Hussein ran, fell. Others say Hussein crawled, crying, Ya Ali, Ya Ali. I don't know which Ali he was calling. Was it Ali his son or Ali his father? But when he reaches the body of Ali al Akbar, they say all the Maqatil say the same thing that Hussein threw himself upon the body of his son. Then he lies next to Ali Akbar. He wipes away the dirt from the cheeks of Ali. He wiped away the blood from the teeth of Ali. 
He placed his cheek on the cheek of Ali Akbar. He cried out, Qatalallahu qawman qataluk. May Allah kill that nation that killed you, O oh my son Ali. Then he calls out, Ala dunya ba'dik al-afa. There's no pleasure left in this dunya after you, Ali. لقد استراحت من حم الدنيا وغمها وأبوك وحيد الفريدة علي علي you have left this world you have left the sorrows of this world علي علي now only your elderly father is left alone to face these sorrows then the army of Yazid say فرفع صوته بالبكاء Hussein's voice began wailing loudly they say Hussein fell upon his son and cried loudly. Then Hussein fell silent. We thought Hussein had died at the body of his son Ali. Who is there that will come and console Hussein? Who is there that will come and give condolences to Abi Abdullah? The Maqtal of Lahuf says, We saw a lady run out from the tent dressed in black. She ran towards Abu Abdullah. She fell upon the body of Ali. Wa Ali, wa Husayna. Oh Hussein, accept the condolences of Zainab. Abu Abdullah looks towards his sister, says, Zainab, not while I'm alive. Abu Abdullah takes his sister back towards the tent. Then in the maqtal it says that Abu Abdullah called the youth of Bani Hashim. He took off his Abba and he says, go bring your brother, take my Abba and go bring the body of your brother Ali al-Akbar. Why is it Abu Abdullah didn't bring the body of Ali? They say three reasons. The first reason is that because Zainab was there. And Abu Abdullah wanted to take his sister Zainab back to the tent. The second reason that they give is that Abu Abdullah was an elderly father, Ali Akbar was a young son. It is difficult for an elderly father to lift the body of his young son. But the third reason they give for why Abu Abdullah did not bring or could not bring back the body of Ali, they say the reason for this is this is the reason why he gave his Abba to the youth of Bani Hashim. Because the Maqtal says, فَقَدَّعُوهُ إِرْبًا irba. They mutilated the body of Ali so badly that when Hussein wanted to lift the body of his son, if he wanted to lift him from the right, the left would fall away. And if he lifted from the left, the right would fall away. Thank you. 